Blog Talk Radio. Separation still curses our intent. Do you not remember the detail of those years? Our past life bringing it to this. History fails in mention what soul has seen. 
With but narrative, I could smite your confusion, clothe you in knowing, and unveil the pretense parading as reality. Comprehension available only to those ready. You'd never believe me anyways, how far out legends reveal. Reason fails to enrapture. It's not my job to convert. I hint only to those having set sail. Mark direction for them seeking passage beyond to often bizarre realms. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores, thinking the world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion, fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Do not forget the myth of our coming. Soon, we will praise heroes of stranger tales than even my own. Watch where it is you wander, friend. The dark night has strange requiem. Mythic acclaim promises new season for those blessed to interpret new meaning. Recognition dawns the eye. Never any coincidental meaning. Come, I await you this way to paradise. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Ben Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv. It's a 5 p.m. Sabbath broadcast. We're streaming out of the East Coast United States near Athens, Georgia. I thank you once again for taking your time uh, and creating some space and some moments for for us to fellowship and to share what revelation and discernment that we've been blessed to have because I definitely consider a lot of you, uh, even the new listeners, but many of you that have been um, supporters of this broadcast for a number of years that have shared with me your own testimony and that have befriended me in the ways that you have. I'm honored to to know you, and I consider you some of the wisest, most earnest, and persistent truth seekers on the planet today. And a lot of us, I feel, are definitely to be counted among the elect and the righteous, that minority which truly aspires to seek the kingdom and that has made that priority for life and being, that has dedicated um, all time and effort in servicing the Father and the Son and in fulfilling role and mission for this incarnation in having brought ourselves to remembrance so that we can be utilized as vessels for whatever is the Father and the Son's will for our life and being. I honor you as I honor myself, and I give, as I always do, all honor, all praise, all worship, and all glory to the Father and the Son for even this, the blessings of this chance, this moment now, even the the time and the space to utter up this prayer and to have fellowship with you. And the fact that we're able to congregate together in what I consider to be like church um, and this to be like service, uh, fellowship, where we can connect together ag- across the broad expanse of time and space and 
streaming over the internet, but yet connect. Uh, um, and there's many of you that are from far reaches in different parts of the world and in places where I will never, ever even have chance to meet you and for us to be able to gather in this way. It's, it's truly a sign of the times and us as being the last generation and that we are the ones that will be witness to the return of our King and our Lord. And so for that, I give all thanks again to the Father and the Son for all blessings and, you know, for this chance now. Uh, the poem that I shared with you is, I believe it's from my third book, A Different Way of Being. It's called The Significance of Babel. Um, and I will be actually including that one in my next book, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny. Uh, I will have 15 poems in that book, various selections from my first three books, which are uh, symbolic of my journey and which also parallel the teachings that are going to be revealed in that book. And I do happen to talk and share a little bit about my testimony and about my path in that book so that I can personalize, um, you know, the journey for you and, and, and help you to understand better my own perspective, my point of view, and what it was that I came through to get to be where I am now. And for those that are interested, uh, that song that I shared is called Jesus Come. And it was put forth, I don't even know the name of the group. Um, it, it, it just says, Acquire the Fire Live. Uh, and I did post a link to that in the chat room for those that are interested in the song. I think it's really one of my new favorites. And I will go ahead and post that again into the chat room for those that are just joined us and that have just now opened up the chat as uh, God's Instrument and a few others were also interested in it. I think it's a very beautiful song and relevant for the times that we're in and uh, for where we are now. I want to give a special shout out for to Professor Truth for being able to join us today and for all the new listeners and for all the old listeners. Uh, I love all of you and I appreciate your audience and uh, for you even taking the time to listen to the things that uh, I have to say. Today we're going to be going into um, the Concealed Book of Baruch, which for those that are um, later interested in wanting to know and to look into the scriptures that I'm going to be going into today, you can download it um, free off of the Internet. It's, the Gnostic, it's part of the Gnostic Bible Collection, which is a a massive collection of, um, of just extra-biblical, extra-canonical works that have been uh, left out. It also includes the Nag Hammadi collection, which was found in 1945. Uh, there's a number of, you know, different scriptures and different passages that are still new and that most people don't yet even understand. And, uh, and if you cannot find it online, you can contact me at zengarcia2010 at gmail.com, and I'll be glad to send it to you as a PDF file. Uh, but for those that either have the book or that have found it um, on the web, we are going to be picking up this passage in the scripture on page 124. And again, this is the concealed book of Baruch. And as we go through this particular uh, book, um, I will give reference to do some of the what Christ cites in Matthew chapter 13 as being some of those secrets that have been 
hidden since the foundation of the world. But before I do so, I want to share two real quick pieces of news and information um, with the listening audience, and I'd like to get your own advice on some of these things. But first thing uh, I'd like to share with you um, about a uh, somebody that I'm going to support with my efforts and also with with my own money as far as donation. It's uh, the Soweta Orphanage Center, and the guy that heads it up is a, a gentleman named Pastor William Wakesa Wasiki, and he has started an, an orphanage, and he's a, a porter as well as a a pastor, and he supports this orphanage with his own money. He's got a number of children um, that have come to be in his care, and it's based out of uh, Nairobi, Kenya, um, and I believe he is asking for cash donations for those of you that are interested in wanting to support a worthy cause like this. Um he has a number of orphans that, as I said, have come to be under his care. And he's asking not only for, for cash donations, but if you, if you happen to have, you know, extra educational books or medication, clothing, um, anything, even, you know, like if you have some, uh, some dry food that you've been putting away for a while and that, is getting close to you know being uh, expired, and you want to donate that to a worthy cause. Um, that would be something that you could really that could really benefit uh, the children over there. Uh, I've decided myself to uh, buy a bunch of first aid kits, and then I'm going to package those up and send them along with a a check uh, so that they can you know, have the cash also to do whatever it is that they need to do. And, of course, uh, any help and any aid that you can provide will be greatly appreciative. And, of course, you know, we're we're to support the orphans and the widows as much as we can. And uh, I could see, you know, really no greater cause than something like this. And so if you are interested in supporting um this particular cause his name is William Wakisa Wasiki and all you would have to put is William Wasiki his last name is W A S I K E and you can send you know whatever it is that you choose to to PO box 177-00 City Squire, Nairobi, dash Kenya, and I also have a phone number if you'd like to speak to him directly and ask him, uh, you know, and also you know check and see if what how your donations are being used, or if you want to um, get involved in any other way uh, with his ministry and with the help that he is providing these children. Phone number is two five four seven two two. Three six two six seven five, and I appreciate um, those of you that do what you can, and of course, you know the father and the son also appreciate whatever aid you can provide as well. Um, now, another question that I've been uh, posed by a, a listener is from a friend. I'm not going to share her name, but I'm going to read just a little bit of her story. She's asking uh, for advice for those of you that have experienced uh, this same kind of paranormal phenomena uh, as as to what she can do to stop these kind of general hauntings that she and her family are experiencing. And so um, I'm going to read this real quick, and then, of course, if you have any advice that you'd like to share, 
uh, please just email me uh, and let me know, and I will forward on your information to her. And then if she so desires, uh, and if you don't mind, uh, I can, you know, put you in contact with each other. Um, She says this. It happened about three years ago. I had opened an antique shop beside my house, and it became like a Stephen King movie. Sadly, it would follow my 13-year-old daughter to school and touch her all day, so I had to homeschool her since I personally can hear them. And years ago, they got evidence of them talking on recorders. They call me all sorts of nasty names and have physically hurt us literally scratches throughout the years. They have pushed two kids down a flight of stairs. Uh, It's a personal nightmare. I have had exorcisms, blessings, and masses through the years. All six of us have either been touched or heard them. My dogs growl at nothing. I am only one. I am the only one that still bothers. I have not had one day of a break in over three years. Fortunately, my faith has grown to tremendous depth, but I am afraid they have some influence over my son. It's so hard to even talk about it because people don't believe in ghosts or demons, but they are very much real and live amongst us. Like one priest said to me that I was born with a unique ability. I have heard these things since I was a little girl and have seen and experienced supernatural things all of my life. But I told them it feels more like a curse. And so uh, I personally have not had experiences with this kind of thing, um, except for one time when I was 15 years old and we were messing with a Ouija board and one of the people that was had the hands on the little thing that they go around and um, put over the letters, I, I witnessed him get possessed, and um, and 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 that was a whole crazy experience because he ran out of the house and I had to go find him. We found him at the back door, scratching on the back of the door. I uh, put him in a full Nelson, dragged him back into the house. We sat him on the couch. He fell over uh, into a deep sleep. His eyes started rolling and moving like he was dreaming. And when we woke him up, he couldn't remember anything that had happened. And, uh, you know, we never did call the priest or anything, but I felt like a priest needed to be contacted. Uh, Anyways, that was my last experience with a Ouija board. Um, You know, and so many kids open themselves up to such things, uh, playing around just, you know, a lot of people in this day and age, they have parties where they're, do seances or try to go into graveyards and or you know play with a Ouija board and they have no idea as to what kind of doors they're opening and what kind of things they are inviting into their lives. Uh, but anyways, if you have any advice for this uh, this lady, please contact me at zengarcia two zero one zero at gmail dot com and. I will forward along your advice and your information. I, once again, I thank you for uh, your efforts, your responses, and any advice that you may be able to share. All right. We're going to go ahead and go into the show. And once again, for those that uh, have not ever heard about, this is the Book of Baruch, but it's not the one that is part of the pseudepigraphal. Uh, or the apocryphal collection. This is the concealed book of Baruch that not a lot of people know about and not a lot of people have ever heard about it. And there's a particular reason why, and we'll get to that reason as we read through some of this, and then I'm going to share commentary. It begins with the oath of secrecy. If you would know what eye has not seen nor ear heard and what has not arisen in the human heart and who stands high above all good, 
swear to keep the mystery of instruction secret. Our Father who saw the good perfected in him has kept the mysteries of silence secret. He has sworn and will not waver. Here is his oath. I swear by the one over all which is the good to keep these mysteries to tell them to no one and not to go from good back to the creation. When you take this oath, you enter the good and see what eye has not seen nor ear heard and what has not arisen in the human heart. You drink from the living water, the washing, the spring of living water bubbling up. And there was a separation of waters from waters. And the waters below the firmament belong to the evil creation. In them are washed those who are earthly and psychical. The waters above the firmament belong to the good and are alive. The spiritual and the living are washed in them. As Elohim was after the washing, he did not waver. The myth of the creator. I want to address something real quick before we go into the rest of this um, this scripture. In this particular book, it speaks about the Elohim and Edom, and it calls the Elohim uh, like the male nature and the Edom as the female nature. And the reason I mention this is because it wasn't um, but a couple of weeks back that some uh, one of my listeners had asked me about what Christ was referencing in the Gospel of Thomas as far as uh, losing the female or losing the feminine. And what he was speaking about is losing what is referred to also in this text as the female, and that means connection to the physical or the physical realms or the fallen realms. And that is cited as femaleness for whatever reason. And maybe it's because um, uh, of Sophia and her fall, uh, and it's referenced as Edom in this particular text, that the, the, um, the female was left um, and became, you know, the visible creation. Uh, and, and we'll get into that as we look into what I'm about to refer to, but um, just know that, and it's not, you know, that all females are uh, are uh, fallen. We're, you know, all males are also fallen. Anybody that is in physical flesh form is in a fallen state of being. And this world as the physical visible universe is also a fallen form in a fallen state of being. But uh, just know that that's what Christ was referring to as losing the female, is losing, you know, and focusing on maleness, which is uh, our spiritual nature. And so for some reason, the spiritual nature is referred to as masculine and the, the fallen physical uh, nature is referred to as feminine or female, um, and so that's what is being referred to and what I'm about to go into. And then the next um, passage goes over the garden parable, which is truly interesting because it covers uh, something that, again, has been hidden since the foundations of the world. The myth of the creators. There were three ungenerated principles governing the cosmos, two male and one female. One of the male principles is called the good, and it alone carries the epithet and knows everything ahead of time. The other male principle is named father of all things begotten in the world, has no forethought, and he is unknown and invisible. The female is angry. She knows nothing ahead of time. She has two minds and two bodies. As in Herodotus' myth, 
She is a virgin above and a viper below. She is called both Edom and Israel. These are the principles of the cosmos, the roots and pools from which all sprang and nothing was else was in the world. When the father, knowing nothing beforehand, saw that half-virgin Edom, he burned for her, and the father is called Elohim. And Edom burned equally for Elohim. Their desire drew them to a single union of love. From this coupling, the father seated 12 angels for himself through Edom. The paternal angels are Michael, Amen, Baruch, Gabriel, Asidius, and then there's, it doesn't name the rest of them. The maternal angels are Babel, Achimoth, Naz, Bel, Belias, Satan, Sael, Adonius, Caiuthan, Pharaoh, Karakamos, and Lathan. Of these 24, the parental, paternal ones side with the father and obey his will in everything. And the maternal ones hear their mother Edom. Their common domain is paradise, about which Moses tells us God planted paradise east of Eden before the face of Edom, and therefore she always looks at paradise, her angels. All right, so just to clarify what was spoken about in this particular passage, which I still have one paragraph. Let me actually read this one paragraph and then I'll make commentary. The angels of paradise are allegorically called trees, which is interesting um, because remember the tree of the um, tree of good and evil and the tree of life. While the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the third maternal angel, and he is Nas, Moses spoke these things covertly because not everyone can hold the truth. All right, so in this particular passage, it, it says that the trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it refers to that tree as one of the fallen angels, and his name is Nas. Now, you notice that all of those angels um, that were referred to, they they are linked to Satan in some way as far as the the um, the, the angels of the visible world. Um, and, and then and it speaks about how the Father's universe is the invisible, unseen, uh, and the spiritual nature of the spiritual universe, and that the 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 female Edom hers is the visible the fallen the physical world all right now this is the part which is of real interest to me and what I wanted to kind of focus on in the the next hour that we're going to be talking about this particular text now again I don't give any credence to this as being on any kind of equal level as to the gospel uh, and what is the foundation of the canon of the Old and New Testament. I'm just bringing forth this particular scripture in this text only because of what I'm about to go into now. And I found it interesting in that in its revelation, it cites one of those things which has been kept, you know, hidden for a very long time that has just now become um, truth for a lot of people. And a lot a lot of individuals are now being led to this particular discernment. And you'll know what I'm talking about once I go into this text. We are on the third part of the, the this particular book, and this is on the creation of Adam and Eve. Oh, one other thing as well before I go into this. Notice how... Oh, I lost my place. Hold on.
notice how um, the last sentence, it says, Moses spoke these things covertly because not everyone can hold the truth. In my mind, that has to do with the garden parable. Because in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, it speaks of that, the of Adam and Eve having eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so many people, even to this day and age, think of that fruit as being a real fruit, like it's shown to be an apple. Some people consider it to be a fig or a pomegranate. But in my work, I have um, shown and, in my mind, verified that that fruit was symbolically holding deeper and more profound meaning for what is truth. And that truth being that the eating of that fruit caused Adam and Eve first to lose their light vestures, their light nature, their bright-natured, immortal, angelic being that they were initially created in by the Father and the Son, and that having lost their bright nature, they were then transformed into flesh where Eve was seduced and beguiled by what it refers to as Nas in this particular text, or who we know as Satan, the adversary. And that that was the reason why Cain, the firstborn of whom everybody cites as being the firstborn child of Adam, why he was of different nature, why he was ill-mannered, and why he was a murderer, liar, and a deceiver. And so in my mind, the, the truth of the garden, and the, once one unlocks it uh, metaphorically and symbolically, that the truth that is contained within those words is that Eve was seduced and beguiled by the devil and that the result of that beguilement was the firstborn of a hybrid race of beings uh, and that this race of beings, this lineage, is wholly different from the children in the line that was born of Adam. Firstly, Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain, but specifically um, of Seth and those that were the patriarchs of Adam's line through Seth and his progeny, of whom we know as referenced as the seed of the woman, and that in um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it speaks about this enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And also Christ in Matthew chapter 13 speaks about the differences between the wheat and the tares and the goat and the sheep. And so unless one has what I consider to be of critical nature as far as discernment, um, so much what is of what is truth that is, you know, reliant on this particular discernment uh, will remain veiled and can't be understood and cannot be explained unless one has this particular discernment. And so we're going to go, let me check the chat room real quick. Yes, I'm reading from the Concealed Book of Baruch. It's in the Gnostic Bible, page 124. For those that are interested, you can uh, you can email me, zengarcia2010 at gmail.com, and I will be glad to um, I will be glad to send you the whole collection on a PDF file but please do that after the show. 
All right, continuing. This is where it gets interesting. All right. After paradise came into being through the love of Elohim and Edom, meaning, you know, as above, so below, kind of, the angels of Elohim took some of the best earth, not from the bestial naked part of Edom, but from her upper civilized regions, and from that good earth they made man. But from the bestial land came wild beasts and creatures. They made man a symbol of their union and love and planted some of their powers in him. Edom provided the soul and Elohim the spirit. The man Adam was a seal and memory of their love, an eternal symbol of the wedding of Edom and Elohim. And as Moses wrote, Eve was image and symbol and the seal of Edom preserved forever. Edom set the soul in Eve and Elohim the spirit. So here we have in the marriage of Adam and Eve, and of course this is after they had fallen because um, their fall is what resulted in them being in physical flesh form. And so their having take on, taken on flesh incarnation is the marriage of the spirit and the physical. All right, continuing. They were given commandments, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Edom gave away all her power to Elohim like a marriage dowry. Until this day, in imitation of that first marriage, a woman comes to her husband with a dowry, obeying a holy and hereditary law that Edom carried out toward Elohim. Part 4, The Angels Divided. When according to Moses, everything was created, including heaven and earth and all therein, the 12 angels of the mother were divided into four principles, and each quadrant is called a river, Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. Huddled in these four parts, the 12 angels circle around and govern the cosmos. Their authority over the world comes from Edom. They are not forever in the same region, but as in a circular chorus, they move from place to place at fixed intervals and periods according to their assignment. When the angels of Pishon rule a region, then famine, distress, and tribulation foul that segment of the earth. For their criterion for ruling is avarice. And in all regions come bad times and disease according to each power and nature. There is a torrent of evil pouring out like the rivers and constantly around the world. Edom, Edom's will controls every quadrant. Elohim's extent, part five. The necessity of evil has this circumstance. When Elohim and Eden in mutual love made the cosmos, Elohim chose to rise to the highest part of heaven to see if their creation lacked any element. He took his angels with him and rose as was his nature, and he abandoned Eden below who being earth declined to follow her husband upward. When Elohim reached the upper border of heaven, he saw a light stronger than the sun he created, and he said, Open the gates for me to enter and to acknowledge the Lord. I had thought I was Lord. He heard a voice out of the light saying, This is the Lord's gate. The just passed through it. 
the gate was immediately opened, and the father without his angels went into the good and saw what eye has not seen or ear heard, and what has not arisen in the human heart. The good said to him, sit down at my right hand. The father said to the good, let me destroy the cosmos I made. My spirit is imprisoned among people. I want to take it back. Then the good told him, nothing which comes from me can be evil. In your companion, you and Edom made the world. Let Edom keep the creation as long as she wishes, but you must stay with me. Edom's promise. Really, this is like the story of um, Sophia and Christ, uh, in that, you know, Christ is whom is referred to in this particular book as the Father, and the good is referred to as being the Father, and Edom is referred to as being Sophia. Um, Because it was Sophia who fell, who left in in the Gnostic story. Um, She wanted to create and have a child without the um, approval of her consort. uh, And in in the Gnostic text, it speaks about uh, Sophia and and Christ as being one holy uh, in togetherness, uh, like a holy... um, the fullness of a holy being. And that Sophia desiring to bring forth a, a child without the approval of her consort, that she birthed whom the Gnostic text referred to as Yaldabaoth. Uh, and Yaldabaoth is the demiurge um, and whom we refer, refer to as Satan the adversary. All right, continuing. Then Edom knew she was abandoned by Elohim and sorrowfully began to gather angels around her and adorn herself brightly to arouse his return. But under the good's control, Elohim no longer descended to Edom. Then Edom commanded Babel, which here means the goddess Aphrodite, to incite fornication and divorce among people. So that as she was separated from Elohim, the spirit of Elohim in people might feel affliction and be tormented and suffer like her. Edom, his abandoned wife, and Edom gave grand authority to Nas, her third angel, to torture the spirit of Elohim in people with all possible tortures. So through that spirit, Elohim might himself be tortured. He who had abandoned Edom in cold violation of their covenant. Now we're about to get to the part which is really interesting. When the father, Elohim, saw these things, he sent down Baruch, his own third angel, to comfort the spirit living in all people. When Baruch came, he stood among the angels of Edom in the midst of paradise. Paradise was the angels among whom he stood. And he commanded the people to eat from every tree in paradise except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which tree is not. They could obey the other 11 angels of Edom, for though they have passion, they do not disobey the commandment. But Nod disobeyed. He approached Eve and seduced her and debauched her which is a transgression. And he approached Adam and played with him as a boy, which is a transgression. So adultery and pederasty 
were born. Since then, evil and good have ruled people. It began from a single source. When the Father ascended to the good, he showed the way for those who wish to rise. And by leaving Eden, he began the evil for his spirit in people. All right, so basically this text is speaking about in this particular passage. uh, It says that Nas, who is one of the fallen angels, of Edom, who is um, the fallen Sophia, or the the who became the visible world, um, and Yaldabaoth, who you know is referenced in the Gnostic text, and this it calls him uh, Nas. It speaks about how this angel approached Eve, seduced her, debauched her, and uh, which is a transgression and also approached Adam and played with him as a boy, which is a transgression. Now, remember that the angels are hermaphroditic in that they're not uh, male or female, but they are both natured. Now, again, I'm just reading from this text, not saying it's uh, inspired or divine in any way. I'm just bringing it to you um, because of this particular you know, revelation, which is contained within it. And also that this is one of those things that in the canonical process with the organized church in the early days when so much of um, the available texts, those that were hidden and disappeared that were stripped away from the masses, two things that, that they were connected to, uh, which a lot of those that had this particular revelation in them, um, that ended up being disappeared. One was any reference to that Cain was a child of the devil. That was one of the things that was hidden. The other thing was that um, that the fallen angels had anything to do with the introduction and the origin of evil upon our particular planet. And that's one of the reasons why the book of Enoch specifically uh, was almost eradicated, but because of the, you know, the protection of the father and the son, that it was revealed to us again. Um, and it's because in this day and age, in this generation, we are to know these particular things. These are some of the biggest secrets that have been kept away from us. Another one of those things which um, a lot of those texts which uh, are referenced or do reference are having been part of um the the angels in heaven, part of the Morning Star administration, part of uh, the divine council of the Elohim, and that we pre-existed, and that we were predestinated uh, for our flesh incarnations to specific role and task. That is also another one of those things which a lot of those texts which are that have that kind of revelation were eradicated and disappeared and kept from us. And so, the, in, in my opinion, of course, um, any text that had to do with those three areas of revelation and discernment were largely hid and stripped away, whether they, you know, were inspired or not. Um, that the forces, the powers that be, which really are the the line of Cain and those that are connected to uh, the birth, you know, of the the men of renown, the the fallen angels, the results of the uh, interdiction of the fallen angels among humanity and their coupling with the the daughters of Cain in creating 
what was a hybrid race of, of beings that became the the priests and the rulers, the kings and queens of this world, and it's these people that are still sitting on the thrones of the world and that are still um, being utilized as puppets, uh, and they're dancing on a string uh, to the devil's symphony. And, you know, it's this particular line and these particular hybrid races that are still being utilized to oppress the masses and to war against the seed of um, the seed of the woman or Adam or the Sethite line, the Adamite. A night watchman asked, was Adam raped? Um, I don't know if Adam was raped in any particular way. I, I just know that it, you know, it refers to in the text that he too ate of the fruit of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And again, the angels are both hermaphroditic. And so they are both male and female. And certainly um, if he ate of the knowledge in uh, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, that the angel could have, you know, presented his, herself, uh, as a, a female form, because uh, it also speaks about in the first book of Adam and Eve that when Satan um, tried to seduce uh, even you know those that were of the line of Adam, he would often present himself in the form of a woman to you know to tempt them into fornicating or to committing evil with him. So however that um, that beguilement with Adam took place, uh, we, you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how that unfolded. We're not given the details of that. We just know that he too ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. Uh, Professor Truth says, recall that the eating was in the angelic form before the fall to prison earth, and that later Eve was raped and possibly Adam. Um, I can't see that word. Oh, defiled. But we don't know how that that took place. But yes. Uh, for those that don't know and you are interested in in exactly how that fall took place, my six book, Sons of God, who we are and why we're here, it gives this in great detail. And I speak about both the fall uh, that led to Adam and Eve losing their light vesture, uh, losing their immortality, and being placed into flesh form. And it was on the eighth day, after the day of rest, after the Sabbath, that their bodies were transformed into flesh. And it was in this form that those things that were cited in Genesis chapter 3, because those were prophecies, uh, that those things would take place. That once they were in fallen flesh form, they were kicked out of paradise and placed here on the wilderness of the earth in a place called the Cave of Treasures, that the prophecies of Genesis 3 took place. Specifically, that Eve would bring forth children in sorrow, that Adam would have to work the soil and the ground in order to bring forth sustenance to feed his children, and the other prophecy that there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent because it would be on the earth and in flesh form that those prophecies would become fulfilled because once Eve and once Adam and Eve were kicked out of paradise, placed onto the earth, their bodies transformed into flesh, that 
Eve was seduced and beguiled by the serpent and impregnated with Cain. And that she would also know her husband, Adam, and that born of that knowing would be Abel and Seth, and that that would result in the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so... All right, continuing on. Just going to read a little bit more of this, and then I want to share something. Um, Another thing which I've read before, but that not, you know, it would be good for um, the the new listeners to, to hear it. All right. Last passage that I'm going to read. It says, Baruch searches for a Savior. Baruch went to Moses and through him spoke to the children of Israel to turn them back to the good. The Edom's third angel, Nod, barred his way. Through the soul, Edom gave him and Moses and all people. Nod expunged Baruch's orders and only Nod's commandments were heard. And so soul was set against spirit. And spirit set against soul. The soul is Edom while the spirit is Elohim. And each is both in man and woman. Remember I referred to, um, in many of my shows, I referred to one of the books that used to be part of the original 80-book canon. And that book is referred to as The Shepherd of Ermaz. Ermaz, H-E-R-M-A-S. And you can look this up in in um, a Google search. You can find this text online. But in a particular part of the that particular book, mandate number six, it speaks about how each one of us has both an angel of righteousness and an angel of unrighteousness with us. And that one is trying to get us to sin and to lead us on the broad path of destruction. And the other is trying to keep us in alignment with our higher self and with that part of us that is aligned to Christ and the Father uh, in that connecting link to Christ and the Father, uh, which is our, our spirit, that part of us which can inherit salvation and that will... Uh, go on to in, uh, an eternal inheritance depending on, you know, those decisions, the behaviors, our acts, and the ways that we are while in this world. But anyways, um, you know, there's always in those children's stories, there's the angel sitting on your right shoulder whispering into your, your right ear trying to lead you on the path of good and the one that's sitting on your left shoulder uh, that's trying to get you to commit evil and to do, uh, to commit sin, that is very much true. And that also explains why all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how righteous we are, all of us are tempted by evil thoughts and tempted by evil inclinations. And that, you know, even, even you know, pastors and preachers, ministers, men of God, all of us throughout our lives have these evil thoughts which are trying to get us to commit sin and trying to get us to do things which are contrary to being in alignment and being in, um, you know, the holy grace of the Father and the Son. And that's why it is that no matter how um, how you know holy uh, and of good nature we become, we have to always be on guard because we always have with us this angel of unrighteousness, which at any time can rear its ugly head and lead us in a moment of weakness 
down the broad path of destruction. And so that's why we have to be vigilant in honoring the Father and the Son and staying in alignment with them and listening to the commandments and the law. Because at any moment, we can fall away and we can be led astray. And it's not just by the temptations of the world or the devil, but that this angel of unrighteousness that dwells within us, that is part of the carnal, the fleshly aspects of who we are, because we are this uh, marriage of the above and the below, a marriage of the what it refers to in this text as the Edom and the Elohim, that um, that we have this binary nature, and we will so until you know until death and our spirit goes on beyond, and we leave behind the flesh. That until that happens, we have to be vigilant and stay on guard because we are going to be tempted by. Um, by this evil inclination, and so, um, and so that's why it is, you know, when you have an evil thought, don't identify with that as being who you really are, but just know that, you know, the you know the devil, the devil's angels are also within us and part of who we are as being in a fallen state of being, as being. Um, spiritual beings caught up in a human experience in a in a human flesh experience. All right, continuing on, and then I'm going to just get to this the last thing that I want to share to you with you today. Then Baruch was sent down to the prophet so that the spirit living in people might hear and flee from Edom and her corrupt creations as once Father Elohim fled. But Nas, using his old tactics, dragged the Father's spirit down into the soul of people he seduced, who scorned Baruch's words in Elohim's commandment. Then Baruch chose a prophet from the uncircumcised, Heracles, and sent him to subdue the twelve angels of Eden and free the Father from the twelve evil angels of the creation. These are the twelve labors in which Heracles contended from first to last with the lion, the hydra, the boar, and the rest. And they are the names of nations given to them from the power of the maternal angels. Just when he seemed victorious, Omphile, who is Babel or Aphrodite, attacked him and seduced him and took away his strength and Baruch's commandments ordered by Elohim, and then she wrapped him in her own robe, the power of Edom, the power from below, and Heracles' prophecies and works were nothing. Finally, in the days of King Herod, this will be the last part that I read. Finally, in the days of King Herod, Baruch was sent down once more by Elohim, And he came to Nazareth and found Jesus, son of Joseph and Mary, feeding sheep, a boy of twelve, and he told them everything that had happened. From the beginning, from Edom and Elohim and all that will be, he said, all the prophets before you were seduced, but Jesus, earthly son, try not to be seduced and preach the word to people and tell them about the Father and the good, and ascend to the good and sit with Elohim, father of us all. And Jesus obeyed the angel. He said, Lord, I will do all things. He affirmed this. Nas wanted to seduce him too, but he could not. Jesus kept faith with Baruch, and Nas was enraged because he could not seduce him, and he had him crucified. Jesus left his body to eat him by the tree and ascended to the good. He said to her, Woman, here is your son. He left his soul. An earthly body, but a spirit he placed in the hands of the Father, and then he ascended to the good. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to what I wanted to read. Let me check the chat room here. 
Hello, Sister Joan. Welcome. Okay. Let me go ahead and pull up this particular passage, and then I'm going to read it to the new listeners. Because I think it's relevant to the things that we're talking about here. It'll give me just a minute to find it. Once again, I appreciate everybody uh, joining me in fellowship and for sharing with me your own concerns and your own testimony. Um, what I'm about to read from was something that was put out in a Steve, a Steve Quell alert, and it speaks about the differences between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. I'm just going to read a couple passages, and then we're going to discuss this and end the show with commentary on this particular thing. Also, I've been asked by people to um, to take phone calls because I know a lot of you would like to share your own commentary uh, and that you'd like to also make remarks and that I've been largely against doing so because every time I have uh, taken phone calls from people, I've had, uh, you know, basically the trolls uh, call in and express things that are not appropriate to the show, uh, whether they, you know, curse or um, just try to take up time that is, with meaningless and nonsensical uh, BS, so to speak. Uh, I'm I'm beginning to think that I will do so, but I, I would have to know, like you would have to enter in the chat room that you would like to call in and that you would have to give me the number that you're going to be calling from so that I know that you're not a troll. Um and and that I will definitely consider doing this because I know. And I would like to have that as part of the show, uh, to have um, dialogue with those of you out there that, you know, have been supporting our work and have been um, reading over my books. I would certainly like to give you a platform for sharing how it, how it was that this information and and my work has uh, influenced and encouraged you, uh, inspired you in any way. Uh, and even those that, you know, have criticism or that, you know, have things to say, you know, if you'd like to, um, you know, challenge me in some way, I, I'm, I'm certainly open to that as well, just as long as you remain respectful uh, and I certainly will also remain respectful. But so I think with the the next show, I will start doing that at the very beginning. I will ask if anybody wants to call in and that you provide your uh, your information, your details, your number that you're going to be calling in from, and then near the end of the show, and even maybe during uh, during the show. I will take calls and allow you to um, express your opinions and to also share your testimony. Um, I think we've reached a point where that could be very helpful to those of you that are, you know, that have been listening for a long time and that would give you a, a platform to to share your own truth and to share you know, where you are in, in this day and age. Uh, with the hour being so late. And also, if you you need to ask the listening audience, uh, those of us as a fellowship, as, you know, um, as a church, really, uh, if you need to ask for any kind of advice or if you'd like uh, people to pray for you, um, 
that we'll we'll make that as part of the show from now on. So just know that we're gonna start doing that, but we'll we'll pick that up um beginning with the next show. But I do appreciate those of you that do want to call in and that do want to share and and so I am trying um to broaden the scope of the show and to, you know, to honor you and to to give you that uh, ability and to make that capacity as part of the um the overall show. So All right. Just going to read a few passages. And this is um again, this was a steep call alert. It was called a uh, box of chocolates. On the plane ride back stateside, my friend, who at the time was one of the most knowledgeable DNA researchers on the planet, pulled out the biggest piece of mental jerky I've ever gnawed on. His benefactor, test subject, believed that while most of the sons of Adam had double-strand DNA, he had been told by his family that he and his blood relatives were distinctly different and that he, like his fathers before him, had triple-strand DNA. He wanted my friend to secretly prove once and for all if this was true or not. The subject claimed that his extended family and their cousins, who are kings, queens, princes, and princesses, as well as leaders of industry and banking worldwide, believe they are children of an otherworldly race of humanoid beings. He'd been taught by his tutors that once upon a time, his ancestors had fallen to earth after some cosmic calamity in the time before. The garden. He believed that while their ancestral mother was Eve, their ancestral father was not Adam. He was torn to know if a child of Cain was actually genetically different and whether he could be saved. Now, of course, I'm not going to be reading the entirety of this alert um, because it's quite lengthy. But if those of you that are interested in reading it in its entirety, you can certainly email me and I'll be glad to make this um, available to you in its fullness. But I'm only going to be covering some key points. All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and skip down to the most relevant parts. It says this. I reached for the water on the table beside me, but it was actually the grandkids' Kool-Aid. I drank it anyway as as I thought to myself, it doesn't really matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what the lying facts say. It doesn't matter what any technical analysis reveals. It doesn't even matter what the religious sages thought or believed. It only matters what they believe because our original subject and his relatives who are kings, queens, princes and princesses as well as leaders of industry and banking worldwide believe and act as though they are children of an otherworldly race of humanoid beings but not human only hybrid human more than human, superior alien human. Our subject and his kin had been taught by their families and tutors that once upon a time their ancestors had fallen to earth. After some cosmic calamity in the time before the garden, he believed that while their ancestral mother was Eve, their ancestral father was not Adam. They believed that they are our humanoid cousins, superior hybrids, half alien and only half human. They once reigned from Olympus and were pharaohs. 
whatever the real truth of their history, their belief is the driver of their actions. Being the true believers, they are, they will continue to operate in accordance with their beliefs. And the laws of alien Darwinian type survival. That's why they interbreed to maintain the purity of the bloodline. That's why they secretly meet and connive to pass power between themselves. And that's why they must fool the rest of humankind into wars of self-destruction and death so that we may be forever enslaved to their lust on this prison planet till death do us part. More than afraid, they know in their hearts this is a fight for survival, the fight for survival. It had begun, just as my friend had said, as a murder investigation, starting with the first murder when that Luciferian demon dad had first whispered of the evil deed to his willing child, Cain, It continued down through time, the sons of Adam fighting for survival and destroying the alien giants in Canaan's land, David and the hybrid Goliath and his four hybrid brothers, and all the hidden true believers since, hiding in plain sight, so powerful, so important, so, so afraid. I was reminded how in the mountains of Afghanistan, The people would save their cousins' lives on the other side of the mountains. Their cousins lived on the other side of the mountains. Then in the next breath, remind you that the word for cousin is interchangeably the same word as enemy. Interchangeably? These earthbound half-cousins of ours continue to last. But it is a nervous laugh at that, as they have a joke or two at our expense, recreating their lying father's fall to earth and flashing their heretofore secret gang signs, hand signs to each other, right in our faces. I know now how dangerous their beliefs are, because they are being driven by their beliefs, taught to them by their real alleged father, the father of all lies. And even now he knows the truth and whispers in his initiate's ears, just as he first did in Cain's ear, the sons of Adam, as long as they live, are dangerous. Just then, my friend began to cite another law, stating, and when you finally out of chocolates, it's time to make stews. I begged his indulgence for a few minutes as I wandered down the hall to the restroom. I was wondering myself, where did I leave my letter? I got to get out of this rabbit's hole before the bad guys figure out there's no rabbits for the rabbit stew they're dreaming up for their cauldron. They might decide to change cookbooks to suit whatever else they might find. Um, yes, there it is, I thought. They thought to serve man. And so that is the end of that particular um, Steve Quell alert. And it basically was information that was sent to him from an investigator that was contacted and his friend was sharing with him the revelation that there was genetic uh, some kind of DNA difference between the son sons of Adam and the sons of Cain or the sons of the devil and that the sons of Cain had three strand DNA whereas we had two strand DNA and um, my friend Professor Truth is an expert at this. Uh, he's in the chat room for those of you that would like more information from him on the three-strand DNA. Um, I'm certain that he would be glad to provide it. Just provide your email 
address, and he will certainly put you on his truth list because he sends out a lot of really incredible information related to all these different things. Um, and, and a professor, if you wouldn't mind, uh, provide your email so that they can contact you and get on your truth list and and receive the different things that you send out that are related to not only this but other things that we've spoken about, you know, our uh, first estate and, uh, you know, us being spiritual beings and pre-existence, predestination, other things of the sort. But um, it, this particular person that I'm speaking about in this Steve Coil alert, his friend was actually murdered to keep this truth hidden and that he picked up the investigation and that he had to open his mind to the possibilities of those things that I just read and that that was the revelation of his work and that he also was led to the same discernment that many of us have been led to, that there are two lives on this planet and that there is a line dedicated to serving the devil and that they are the New World Order, they are the Illuminati, and they are the ones that are pushing us towards world government. They're the ones that Christ referred to as being the synagogue of Satan, as being the the Pharisees and those that are of their father the devil that were the killers of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. And how could that be unless Cain was a child of the devil? Because citing Abel to Zacharias when Cain was the murderer of Abel, he's telling you a secret right there. He's letting you know that Cain was not of the sons of Adam. And then if you look at Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38, Christ is citing his lineage. He's citing who he was born of all the way to the time of Seth because he was a son of Adam. And he was of the bloodline of the wheat, the bloodline of of who are the priests because the sons of Cain they follow kingship and the divine right to rule and they consider themselves to be kings in service to self and not in service to humanity and Christ he was a foot washer a priest and he was in service to others in service to humanity just as the other priests of the sons of Adam. And so you have to know the difference. You have to know that there are two bloodlines on this planet and that one is dedicated to evil and that one is the New World Order and that they are leading us to destruction. Anyways, we'll pick this up next week and I will... Start taking phone calls, and I will allow you to share your testimony and to ask for advice, or if you have questions, we'll take them directly. Uh, Yahushua, Yahua, bless all of you. Um, Till next Saturday. God bless all.